Thank you very much. I'm going to take a picture of this because it's a big old audience. I don't know if I'm going to get anything, though. Um, the flashlights. Um, yeah, no, I, I want to talk to you about a few things today. And I think that's a great question about does a risk-based um, business allow you to be, take braver decisions? And I've reflected on it. It's quite a hard question. And I came to the conclusion I don't think it does. I don't think it makes a difference what industry you are in. But what I do believe about courage um, is, is related to uh, the three elements of culture. And if you take the three elements of culture, first one being um, the, the vision of the organization, the second thing being the purpose of the organization, and the third thing being the leadership of the organization, I think it's that leadership thing that is the most important of all. Um, and if I take Hiscox's journey over the last 13 years, I've been there from, from being a $1 billion turnover business to a $4 billion turnover business today on the just at the bottom of the, just about to get into the FTSE 100 in the next couple of years, or the next couple of months, hopefully. Um, it's really been exemplified by the leadership from the very, very top. And that is a guy called Robert Hiscox, who was the chairman until recently. I had dinner with him last night. We had a partners meeting in Frankfurt. And this is a guy who, who's been in the insurance industry for 40 years. In many ways, he's defined the insurance industry. He saved Lloyd's in the 1990s. He um, had the bravery to bring in people from outside the industry like me. And yet, in all that time, he hasn't got a single letter after his name. He hasn't got a single recognition from anyone. And you think, why is that? Well, because he, in his own words, he speaks truth to power. He doesn't care about the consequences of speaking out. He says, um, you know, he says it as he hears it, and he will say it to anybody. And I've heard him take on some very big beasts in the jungle. And that courage is infectious in organizations. So, I was, again, at the partners meeting yesterday, uh, my, my boss, when I joined, my boss still is, a guy called Bronick Masayada, the CEO. He was, um, people were talking about courage. Courage is one of our values, by the way. It's our central value. It's the one that we angst about the most. And we define courage as do the right thing no matter how hard. Now, those of you who, are, who know anything about this know that's pretty much lifted from the British Army. But it talks to that moral courage. It doesn't talk to that physical courage. It talks about doing the right thing no matter how hard. And, and Bronick was picked out. By, by a lot of people for being the guy who's really led that courageous culture in the organization. But, it, but he got it from, from, from Robert, and I got it from them. And, and when I joined in 2005 they, from, from Diageo, a fantastic company, I'll tell a story about that in a moment, um, they, um, they basically gave me 10 million quid and said, we, we want a thing called a brand. We don't kind of know how it works. Could you go and try and fix it? And that is an enormous responsibility in an organization which has never done any marketing before. But that's kind of how the Hiscox way works. My strap line in the US business I run now is a different campaign. This is from the UK. Our strap line in the, UK, in the US is encourage courage. We are the largest small business insurer in the US. We are trying to get um, that startup mentality right through the culture, and it inculcates everything we do. Um, so I do think that that is, is it's leadership that, that, that enables courage. I think what Syl talked there about leaders being vulnerable is, is the really, that is so powerful. I've seen that in action. And it's about the leadership. And in this room, we have some of the, the most senior leaderships in the UK. And you have got a huge role in this. But I want to tell you three quick stories um, about um, things I have got wrong. And I have got many, 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 many more things wrong than I have got right. I'm just fortunate that the right things were big things. And most of the wrong things were small things. But I'm going to talk about a couple of things. And there's, and there's kind of three definitions of courage. Courage is really quite complex. And it is fascinating. As I said, we angst about it at Hiscox every day of the week that we're not being courageous enough. First story is, is what I would call the John Wayne story. And John Wayne's definition of courage was, you know, being scared to death and still saddling up. Now, tell a story about me and that. The second one is about the importance of following your intuition, your gut, in a circumstances when the pressures are on you to do one thing. And it's when I completely bottled it on an international stage with a global brand, and I was the only guy in the company ever to get it wrong. And then the third one I want to leave you with is, is I think, the most important thing. And that's what I call the million small moments of courage because those are the things that build up the muscle of courage in an organization. But anyway, John Wayne. Um, I was marketing director for Coca-Cola in Brazil in the, the late 90s, and um, big, big market, big budgets, big profile, everything else. And uh, one of our bottlers, and bottlers in, in Latin America in particular, are usually rich local guys. They've got a car franchise. They might own a bank, and they always have a Coca-Cola franchise. So they're kind of, it's a bit of a playboy lifestyle for these guys. But anyway, this, this uh, bottler down in a place called Curitiba, in the south of the country, um, organized a thing called the World Marketing Forum, which sounds pretty grand for a kind of jungle city in the middle of nowhere. But, but he threw like 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 dollars at this. Um, so he invited me down to, be, uh, to do the introductions. 
and uh, and they had people like uh, Reese and Trout down from Harvard. They had the head of Nike down. I mean, he, he just flew in everybody, and this is a rock star conference. And he says, well, as marketing director for Coca-Cola, we'd just like you to come down and open, open the conference. I said, fine. So six months to go, I says, still just want me to open the conference? He said, yeah, fine, just come down and open the conference. One month ago, do you still want me to open the conference? Yeah, just, no, do I need slides? No, you don't need any slides, just come down. So you get there, I meet him at the airport, he's pissing himself laughing, because he's playboy, kind of thinks things are funny like this, and he says, right, I've lied to you, he says, you're the keynote speaker after lunch. You're on after a recent trout, and uh, before the, the CEO of Nike, and you, and, and you know the funny thing is, I didn't tell you, oh, oh, this is hilarious, I'm thinking, right. Oh, and the other thing is, it's two and a half thousand people in two auditoriums, and it's been broadcast live in O Global, which is the equivalent of the BBC. And you're not prepared, right? So what? It, so and it is, it's one of the few times I think in in in, in your life and your career where you're actually absolutely shit scared. So I says, can I go and sit in a room and just get my notes together? And I sat in a room. It was a windowless room, and I stared at the wall. And I went through every single emotion you can imagine. This was the ultimate fight or flight moment. Right, oh, I'll show him, I'll just screw this, I'll walk out to, I'll throw myself down the stairs and I'll pretend I've got a broken leg <laughs> to, I want my mum. Um, <laughs> seriously. Because, and, and Global kept going, BBC kept going, going so what are you going to talk about? I said, ah, oh, it's going to be a secret. I'm thinking, Jesus H. Christ. <laughs> and you do get to a moment in time, though, when you are literally faced, that fight or flight moment, which fortunately I've only faced two or three times in my life, but there is a moment, there is a moment when you are faced with a decision, what you do about it. And in that moment, I thought, right, screw him. I'm going to make this work. And I sat in the front of the audience, and I listened to these great speakers with their fantastic slideshows and everything else. And, um, and I just made notes after notes after notes. And, and I went deeper than I've ever been in my life into my, the depths of my soul, if there is such a thing, and put together a kind of presentation in my head. Now, that, that's fine, but you need a bridge. You need to get the audience on your side. You just can't turn up and, you know, with nothing. And, of course, this being Brazil... Um, it's football. And in Curitiba, as, as things would have it, there are two football teams. One plays in blue, one plays in red. Coca-Cola plays in red, Pepsi plays in blue. There was my bridge into the conversation. So um, lunch came. I went again, Globe was interviewing me. I said, no, no, you got to get it. So I just stood up and says, right, okay, you've seen these amazing AV presentations from the, some of the greatest companies in the world. You've heard recent trout, the two greatest marketing thinkers on the earth. He said, right, I'm standing here in front of you now. I have no slides. I have no videos. I am the so what man. And I just winged it for 45 minutes. And I got a standing ovation. And it was live on TV and everything else. But I tell you, please, you never, ever, ever want to go through that in your life. But, but what it taught me was you can face those moments. And you do have a genuine choice. And I could have made excuses to walk out of that room. And they'd have been legitimate because that swine, and he is a swine to this day, that swine thought this was absolutely hilarious in his playboy lifestyle. But, but you know, when you're faced with those moments, those John Wayne moments of, I'm scared to death, but you still saddle up, I think those are important that when you confront them, you can do them. So, biggest commercial failure ever, and still will know this one. Um, I was a uh, marketing director in, uh, get, for Diageo in Ireland, great job, did well. Um, I eventually got my first general management job to be managing director of, of Italy, which is a great job and a fantastic part of the world. You know, they, they try and punt you off with places like Bulgaria and Venezuela, and if you keep saying no, eventually you get a nice place. So I got a nice place. Um, it was that simple. Um, now, the interesting thing about Italy was it was the only market in the world of the 120 markets that Diageo operated in that had not launched Smirnoff Ice. And you've all heard of Smirnoff Ice. And... So when I get there, your first year in your first GM job, um, and you know it's like, come on, Steve, you can, you know, can do this, you can do this. And we did the research, we did the research, and the numbers could have went either way. You can interpret numbers what you are. And 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 what happened in that market was the big competitor, Bacardi Breezer, had launched, become number one, was a runaway success. Everything in my gut told me, don't try and take on an established number one with a product that is not sufficiently clearly differentiated. Don't do it. But everything in my brain, everything in my, um, everything in that kind of corporate pressure, and it was positive pressure. It wasn't, it, it was no kind of command and control in that kind of environment. It was a great culture, and it still is a great culture at Diageo. Um, they were saying, come on, Steve, you can't be the only market in the world that hasn't, you know, it's just you're the first GM, you can make this happen. I, but everything said, don't do it. And I bottled it. 
I completely bottled it. I fell in with the, um, you know, the kind of corporate thing. And it was great. And they were very supportive. The marketing budgets flowed in. I think we spent, wasted 15 million pounds in the first year. I think we wasted 20 million pounds in the second year. And it was a complete and utter disaster on a global stage in front of 120 countries. And it was my first big outing as a GM. Um, and it, by God, it taught me a lesson. It taught me two lessons. Um, and it really speaks to what uh, Syl was saying. Diageo culture was fantastic about it, which is not what you expect. You expect to be fired on the spot for getting something like that wrong, being the only guy ever to get it wrong. Um, but they weren't, they were fantastic. But it taught me the absolute critical importance of, and I am a kind of rational, analytical person. You know, and you think I can, I used to, you know, you can figure all this out and then that's the answer. But it's never the answer. Always, it's what Steve Jobs said at his Stanford final speech in 2005. Always follow your intuition. Always follow your gut. If you're not sure about something, you know, it's the heart that will tell you what you need to do. It's not the head. So that was, that was my biggest commercial learning and that's something I've taken on. The last thing I'll leave you with is this, is what I call these million small moments of courage. Right? Everybody in here presumably has, a, has had a performance review at some point in their career. Hands up everybody who's had a performance review. Okay, hands down. Hands up who's, who's had a bad performance review where you've either given it yourself or your boss has bottled it. That's what I mean by one of the, these million small moments of courage. You will build courage in an organization from the bottom up just as much as you will be inspired by leadership from the top down. If you don't give somebody, if you can't find the courage in you just to have a conversation with them and explain to them why they're not doing as well as they want and you can't support them doing that, then you're never going to build courage in an organization. So call it out when you see it and make sure as you go back into your organization, you find it in yourself because people find it incredibly hard. Robert Hiscox, for all his courage, he used to call me up and he says, Steve, Steve, can you come down and fire this person because you're really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I says... Robert, that's bollocks. I said, that's the hardest thing in the world to fire someone. And I never fire people unless it's the end of a conversation that's taken an 18-month journey. So we, but it starts off with a, a miniature moment of courage, a tiny moment of courage, where you find it in yourself to say why you're not happy. You find it in yourself to articulate the reasons for it. You find it in yourself to be bothered to find the evidence for it, and you start a conversation. And if it gets to the end of 18 months and it doesn't work out, then that's, that's an outcome. But it's not just, you know come down and fire someone so so yeah when you're sh scared to death saddle up <laughs> um follow your gut and it all starts with a miniature one with these million moments of of miniature courage that's my story <laughs> yep. oh, I'll come over here. thanks <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask Steve, I mean, how do you know when you've created a culture of courage? Um, I think it talks, to, again, I'd, I'd go back to what Sil says. I think this is the, the ability of a, of a culture to, to um, celebrate failure in some ways, to actually allow people to actually get on with stuff. We've, I, put, for instance, put in our marketing operating plan, I'm also chief marketing officer as well as for the group as well as the CEO for the USA. And we have a 5% failure fund in each of the marketing budgets, which you're expected to go out and just play um, with stuff like that. So I think that's really important. Um, I, I really get, I go back to the stories of, I think senior leadership, though, has got a massive, massive role to, to go out there and, and be vulnerable and tell real stories about themselves um, that, that, that talk to people at a level that's not just about the numbers, it's not just about um, how, how the business is doing or... It's not just that that TV ad didn't work well, blah, blah, blah. It goes, um, goes to a much deeper level. But I do think it goes back to leadership. I think it goes back to the, some of the structures you put upon leadership. But if the leaders are not prepared to be authentic and vulnerable, forget it. Everything else is just window dressing. We've got a room full of marketers. How do they rank in terms of being bra uh, brave in comparison to other sort of uh, parts of the organisation? I think it's, a, it's a, again a very good question. I think it's changed over the years. I think it's become much harder for marketeers to become to be brave. If you go back to, I met somebody in the audience who had seen for thirty-five years my very first marketing job, and and those and I'm very old, obviously. So um, <laughs> um, in those days, there were there were marketing cathedrals. You could join Proctors in Newcastle upon Tyne. You could join Cadbury's in Birmingham. You could join Heinz in Middlesex. You could join any number of great companies around. Uh, the UK and, and marketing. I remember when I joined Roundtree's, my very first company, and I started in IT. It was anyway. Um, 
they, they, so in the ID department, they come around and they show you a, a wheel with spokes on it. And they would have production, they'd have, they'd have HR, they'd have finance, everything else. And at the center of it would be marketing. And I think in those days when marketing was absolutely the center of, of the hub of activities in those great marketing cathedrals, I think it was uh, much clearer how you could be brave. It was much more expected of how you could be brave. But in this kind of fragmented world of, of digital marketing, and there are no great universities of marketing left in the UK, really, um, I think it's much harder. So I do think, though, at the end of the day, it goes back to who do you want to be? That, that great quote about first life and second life, I think, was, was, is really relevant in this. You've just got to put yourself out there. You've just got to get yourself at the center of the action, even though that's no longer a formality in most uh, UK companies. And you've just got to take those risks. You've got to take those risks. If they want to go and work abroad, you go and do that. If, if they want to go and work, you know, you, you've just got to put yourself out there. And I don't see, generally, this is a terrible generalization, I don't see enough of that bravery these days, and it, it worries me. How do you do that within a team when you're working with you know, different people, different personalities, different levels of, of sort of um, degrees of what they think brave is? I think, you, I think it's like any team that you, 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 you've got to try and build. You've got to, you've got to, that team's got to get very honest very quickly about who they are and what they're, what they're about and where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are. And that, that's a journey, again, I've been on. Um, I, was, I, am, I am now an extrovert. I, I don't think I originally started off as an extrovert. Um, there's a great book about Myers-Briggs, by the way, called, uh, you may have read it just recently. It's a very interesting read about, about Myers-Briggs and what it is and what it's not. Um, so people can change. I, I think everybody in those teams, you've got to get people understanding where they come from and you've got to have that honesty in the team and you've got to build those structures around that. And as a leader, again, you've got to take the lead. You've got to show that vulnerability. Vulnerability come, comes up time and time and time again in terms of how you center courage in an organization. And if you can't show vulnerability, you will have no prospect of, of being believed to be an authentic leader. So, so lead, be vulnerable, be authentic, but make sure you get everybody to come and play and then you've got a chance. Let's uh, open up the floor to some questions. There's a mic going round, so just if you could put your hand up. Yep, there's just one at the front. Hi, Stephen Mayer from MBA. Um, Steve, you're obviously an extremely brave and courageous man, but you're also very resilient, and Martin Glenn talked about resilience earlier on. Do you think your resilience is nurture or nature? Um, I think it's nurture. I think we all start off with a degree of um, resilience. But if I think back to the young me, the one that was confronted by my fellow marketeer from Roundtree's 35 years ago, I was a complete snowflake, if I was absolutely honest. So um, <laughs> I, I remember speaking to Paul Walsh, the old CEO of Diageo, and saying, how do you do it? How do you get on that plane? How do you turn up? How do you stay, you know, how do you stay that course? And he talked very eloquently about, about resilience. So you learn the tricks, you learn the, um, the techniques. There are techniques, but it is definitely nurture, my view. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yep, just one right at the very back if a microphone could go around. Hi, it's Anil from Teeds. Um, when you're building your teams, are there things that you look for char characteristics to build out a braver team? Or are you doing that during the training process? Um, very good question. We had a big debate yesterday about is there a Hiscox type, and we came to the conclusion there is. Um, um, so I, th I think Darwin works in organizations. I think certain organizations build themselves in certain ways. Um, I think the, 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 the challenge I've always had as an individual and, and the organization has always had as, a, as, a, as an enterprise is that a, a certain, you can find that kind of type in all different types of people. So for instance, at Hiscox, we're not very good with introverts, and that's a big weakness. We're pretty good in diversity, we're pretty good in gender, but not very good with kind of just sheer old introverts. And there's this, so we've got to find ways of building that out. Um, I, I certainly know my leadership teams in the UK, I ran the UK business for 13 years. Um, it, was, it was a bit of a standing joke. I liked extroverts and we always had one introvert in the team and it was a bit of whack-a-mole, you know, so it was a bit, <laughs> but, um, but you know, I'm being, I'm being honest here. Um, but you know, the power you unleash in a team when you realize that is, that is one of your failings and you can, and you can bring that in. So, so I do think organizations have a type. Um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer in that. I, I, I disagree with the notion that, that it can be all types. So the, the DNA of an organization is, is what it is. I think the role as a leader in there is to get the best of the talent you've got and the most diverse range of talent, accepting there is 
um, a, a role. And if you go to our brand book, um, Keith Weed was very kind to let me use a, a, a image of Marmite on page eight. And we just, we're on the shin, we say we're a Marmite company. You know, you either like it, if you, if you like responsibility, um, and, and you, you can do the 35,000 feet strategizing, but you can also go on the stairwell and someone's crying and put your arm around them as a, as a director and ask them what's wrong. You do well at Hiscox. If you are one or the other, or you like staying in a cubicle, you, you fail. So I think understanding what that is, but then once you understand what that type is, you build out the talent within that, I think, and, and you try and make it a, a place for all those talents that, that, that enjoy that culture. Steve, thank you so much okay, for your time. You. Great hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.